very much. So today it's my enormous pleasure to welcome um, a very long-term uh, friend and colleague, uh, Jim Cochran. Jim is, uh, works within the University of Alabama. Um, he's heavily involved so within the School of Business there. He's one of the key leaders within their business analytics programs within that, within that uh, university. I've known Jim for many, many years in our roles and developed in our roles of the connection between the and the international development sphere. And so for those people who have read Jim's sort of, um, CV yeah, as part of that sort of the abstract, you'll see that it's probably a safer bet you wouldn't think of any random country in the world. Probably a safer bet that Jim has been to that country and is probably more statistics in that country as opposed to that he hasn't. Um, and Jim has been, that is, Jim has been awarded with a number of uh, a number of awards for the work that he's done, including the Carly Peets Award and the Founders Award, both from the American Stats Association. And I think Tom is one of the key people involved in nominating Jim for these awards. So I'm absolutely delighted that Jim has been recognised for the long term work he's done. Here we're going to be speaking about um, one of the sort of very controversial topics of how does the where does this fit into um, understanding candidates as, as they lead up to right, the um, events of political election? As I was reminding Jim um, recently, that it doesn't seem like there's on any day which goes by in Australia where certain politicians within the states as we have we mentioned, and so it'll be interesting to explore on it, what sort of candidates we have for these elections. That's enough off link for me. Um, so it's almost enough off link for me. As Marcus sort of said, um, in, in terms of the housekeeping, as we go through the presentation, I um, will ask you to keep your microphones on mute. If, um, at any point in the presentation, please pop questions into the chat box. If there's any technical issues, Mark, um, um, other Mark will be able to help you with those technical issues. Um, but put those questions into the chat box, and at, at the end of my Jim's presentation, I'll be going through and reading out um, and asking a question from your behalf. Question answer period at the W. All that being said, Jim, really, really looking forward to your presentation. Okay, well, thank you very much for that kind invitation, Mark, and uh, thank you for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with you. Uh, I think it's the first time I've ever given a talk across two days and in the afternoon, in the morning, and in the evening simultaneously. Uh, so this is a very, very interesting experience. Also, thanks to, uh, to Mark Wick for uh, the technical support that he's provided and the Statistical Society of Australia for putting on this event and for all of you for attending. Uh, right now, do you see a gray screen with the red stripe on top? Okay, great. All right, so we are actually ready to go. Uh, we're gonna talk about some research today that I've worked on for several years off and on. Hang on, there we go. It's called Frankenstein for President. Um, I am the Associate Dean for Research and Professor of Applied Statistics and Roger Spivey Fellow at the University of Alabama. Uh, you can reach me at this email address. And uh, we're gonna talk a little bit, like I said today, about this research, Frankenstein for President. Um, it all starts about 30 years ago when I was working at a company called Burgoyne Marketing Research. The company was a top 20 privately held marketing research firm in the United States, so it was large. My job was director of analytic services for the organization. So I was responsible for overseeing a, uh, a stable of analysts who would perform statistical analyses. They would write up uh, summaries of preliminary results. I got involved in study design. I got involved in implementation. Uh, I, it was a very interesting job for a short while. Uh, I accepted the job in 1987. 1988, we peaked at 150 employees and peaked is a key word here. 1989, we were purchased by a company from New York called SPAR. And uh-oh uh is uh, the key word here. 1990, we were down to 11 employees and I was number 12. Now, my favorite project that never quite materialized was to work with a major studio to design the optimal plot for the sequel to Gone with the Wind. So the first 
um, the first, uh, what would you call, um, uh, inspiration for this research. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. Doesn't really care much for the work, but I hope the rest of you do. Uh, it was Gone with the Wind, classic movie from 1939. Uh, we had a client contact us who had an option on the rights to develop the sequel to Gone with the Wind. Well, there is no sequel to Gone with the Wind, and, and these people wanted me to come up with mathematically some way to give them, in their mind, an optimal plot. And I imagine optimal plot for them would be the one that would maximize the length of the lines of people waiting to get into the theater to see the, the uh, sequel. All right, so what was it about this problem that really intrigued me? There were really four things that, that hooked me uh, as far as this problem. This is a very unique and non-traditional problem, all right? So that, that alone was enough to get me, but you add to that that it would present an awful lot of very, very difficult and interesting modeling challenges. Uh, it wasn't lost on me at all. I was a kid and the idea of doing something that would upset uh, movie purists uh, actually made me very happy inside. I thought that would be kind of fun to hear their reaction when they found out that the movie that they loved so much had been designed with mathematics. Uh, and then finally, and this is something I'd been working on quite a bit, uh, I didn't feel that marketers really appreciated or understand or utilized mathematical programming, operations research, and constrained optimization in the way that they should. All right. So we start off with, with what I like to call the general share of choices problem. So the question is, why not use operations research to build some sort of a prototype or a service? Uh, uh, prototype product or service. And the movie would have been obviously a product, all right? A prototype consists of choices for several attributes, right? You've got uh, a product might be comprised of nine or 10 different attributes. And on each of those, you might have four or five or six different choices when you're designing your product. The attributes generally either exist at one of several discrete levels or they can be discretized. And a consumer is thought to purchase or consider the purchase of any product that produces greater utility for him or her than any available alternative on the market. Right, so what do I mean by attributes and attribute levels? Uh, I've got an example here and I used this example a couple of weeks ago in a short version of this talk that I gave at the Informs Regional Analytics Conference that was held in Chicago. And I didn't go to Chicago, no, I gave it from right here. In, in my home office as well, but uh, I, I found an example I wanted to use for you to indicate what I mean by attributes and attribute levels. And when you see it, you'll understand why the people in Chicago got kind of excited about it. I chose, is it the DeVoe Coupe? This is a, an automobile manufactured in Australia. Uh, I don't know if it's popular or not, but it looks to me like it, it would be a lot of fun to own and drive. Uh, now, if we're talking about attributes of this car, one of them could be the roof. It could be a hard top, it could be a moon roof, or it could be a convertible. Although I think uh, it'd be a real waste to make this car with anything but a convertible top. Uh, same thing with the transmission. It could be automatic, semi-automatic, or the natural choice here, I think, would be a manual transmission. Uh, you could even talk about the color, red, blue, or silver. All right, so we have attributes and we have attribute levels. Going to have to introduce just a little bit of mathematics here to move forward. Uh, first, some notation. <clears throat> Small n is going to represent the number of respondents we have in our data, and it will be indexed with the lowercase i. Capital K is the number of attributes that comprise our product, and it's indexed with the lowercase k. Capital L sub lowercase k is the number of levels that attribute k has. Uh, mu super i sub kl is the relative utility that respondent i associates with level l of attribute k. Lowercase h sub i is sometimes what we call the hurdle. It's the total relative utility that's associated by respondent i with his or her current choice. And we might even add a small epsilon to that to break the tie. You know, oftentimes marketers will say, if all you can offer somebody is the same utility that they currently have in a product, 
they're not going to switch to your product. So we might require a new product that we design to offer some more utility than the best current product uh, for a, uh, a consumer or respondent. Lowercase c of i is the weight associated with respondent i. X k of l is one if level l of attribute k is chosen and zero otherwise. So this is how we actually identify which level of each attribute we select in our prototype. And lowercase y sub n is one if respondent i is captured or satisfied and zero otherwise. And this is how we count or, or, or assess the weighted number of respondents that we actually capture with the prototype product or service that we design. All right. Now here's our formulation. I'm gonna start out by talking about a set of constraints. Uh, if you look at these constraints, on the left-hand side, we have a series of constraints for each respondent. Uh, on the left-hand side, we have a vector that represents the utility that the respondent associates with each level of each attribute. Uh, we dot product that with this x vector, which is a series of zeros and ones, depending on whether we chose a particular level for each attribute. So when we take the dot product of the mu vector and the x vector, we get a sum of the utilities for respondent i for that particular prototype. If that value exceeds h, then y is free to raise up to one and it's added to the objective function. If it does not exceed h, then y is forced to be zero. You see down at the bottom of the formulation, y is a zero one variable. So y cannot be one until the, the utility that a current, that the uh, prototype that we have designed generates utility for that respondent that exceeds his or her hurdle. The next set of constraints are a little easier to understand. Basically what this does is for each attribute, it limits us to selecting one level, right? You can't have a car that's both automatic and stick shift, for example, right? The, the uh, objective function counts the weighted number of respondents that's covered by our prototype that we pick through this model. The X's are basically ensure that attributes are not partially selected. They're either zeros or ones. And the Y's ensure that respondents are not partially selected. They're either zeros or ones as well. Right now, this problem has been shown by Kohli and Krishnamurti in 1989 to be NP hard. And uh, three colleagues and I solved it to optimality in 2005. I'm not going to talk much about the algorithm, but it is kind of slick. All right. So in words, what does this model really do? What does it do to help us find a prototype? Well, first of all, we use the attribute levels associated by a respondent with each existing product on each attribute and the utility associated with the same respondent on these levels to find the estimated utility that that respondent associates with each existing product. And this is pre-processing, it's before we model. Then we find the existing product for that respondent with maximum utility and that becomes the H of I and is fed into the model. We then run the model and the model finds the collection of attribute levels, limiting ourselves to one level for each attribute that generates more value than the existing product with maximum utility for the maximum number of respondents after we apply the weight to the respondents. And oftentimes the weights are just one because we maybe we just wanna uh, maximize the number of respondents or the proportion of respondents who we want to uh, appeal to, All right? Now the second step, is greatly simplified if there's only one existing product because then you have a competition between two. And you might say, well, Jim, that really doesn't sound like much of a market. That doesn't sound very competitive. And it's not, but it becomes important when we start talking about the presidential election in the United States because we generally only have two candidates. I'm not a crook. All right, this is the second inspiration for the research. President Richard Milhouse Nixon. I saw this book in a library in junior high school when I was about 12 or 13 years old. And the idea of a US president's face on the package of a cigarettes, a, a package of cigarettes on a cover of a book really appealed to the sort of subversive side of the young teenager in me. Uh, so I picked up the book and I read it 
And it's a fascinating account how in 1968, the Republican Party in the United States had a, a presumptive candidate for president. And he said some really strange things and people ran from him uh, and, and abandoned his candidacy. And now the Republicans are left needing a candidate. And they're sitting around a room that the, in a smoke-filled room, I guess, and one of them said, why don't we run Richard Nixon? He used to be the governor of California. And another one said, yeah, well, we ran him in 1960 against John F. Kennedy, and that didn't go so well. The response was, well, yeah, in 1960, we tried to run him as a human being. This time, we'll run him as a product. It's a fascinating book. It really details how, how um, politics in our country turn rather abrupt, abruptly on this election. Anyway, I'm walking through the library at the University of Cincinnati in 1999. If you get the idea that I like to spend time in libraries, that's accurate. But walking through the library in University of Cincinnati in 1999, I looked down and I saw this book. And almost immediately I started thinking, hey, I could take my work on product optimization and apply it to a presidential campaign. This could be really cool. So then the question becomes, how do you apply the framework for product optimization to finding the optimal political platform, which is nothing more than a collection of a candidate's position on the salient or important issues? Well, I think the mapping is pretty easy to see if you think about it. Issues are analogous to attributes for products. Positions that candidates can take on issues are analogous to the levels of product attributes. And now we just assume that a voter is going to vote for whichever candidate generates more utility through his or her positions on issues. All right, so our research objectives here are many. We want to estimate the outcome that will result if the candidates maintain their current perceived positions. And this is actually really simple. Once we find out what each respondent believes is each candidate's perceived position on each issue, and we figure out how much utility each respondent associates with those positions, it's pretty easy to calculate the utility for the two candidates for each respondent, and then give the candidate, give the respondent to the candidate who generates more utility for him or her. This is not difficult at all. Second, we want to identify critical issues in the election. We also want to determine the optimal position one candidate can assume relative to the opponent's current position, and that's the model that we just looked at. We also want to estimate what the outcome would result from that, uh, such a position, right? We also want to isolate states and regions where the outcome is most uncertain and identify the key issues for voters in those geographies. We want to assess relative strength of each candidate's platform in various states and regions with demographic groups and identify the key issues for those groups in those key regions. There have been a lot of different approaches to this problem, but none of them are anything like this. And I'm not gonna go through all of these because frankly, there are hundreds of publications in this area. And I'm even gonna talk about the examples I show you. I just wanna give you some idea of what is out there. Ithiel Poole uh, wrote what's considered to be a seminal article in 1965. Basically what Poole and his, his colleagues did is they, sent, they basically did a, 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 a oh shoot, a, they sampled separate demographies and they calculated the proportion of people that were gonna vote for a candidate in each of those demographies. Then they used weighted averages to figure out who was going to win. That's kind of what most other people have done. Rabinowitz has, has some interesting work. Erickson and Sigmund, uh, Jackman and Rivers have some nice stuff. They actually start to move down to the state level instead of looking at the national level. We're gonna talk in a minute why that's important. Uh, and my friends, Ed Kaplan and Arnie Barnett did some really nice stuff in uh, 2003. But these are all missing something. The question is what are each of these approaches missing? And the answer is pretty simple. None of these approaches really assess the importance or value that the individual voters or respondents place on the positions the candidates can assume on each issue. In other words, they're missing utility, basic economic concept. 
Right, so the research methodology is as follows. We determine the critical issues and potential positions that the presidential candidates can assume on each issue. And we usually do this through reviewing uh, uh, the, the media, newspapers, magazines, uh, internet now, uh, and focus groups. Right? We then administer a survey to a stratified random sample of registered voters in battleground states. And I'll talk about what battleground states mean in a minute. And we do this so that we can use an approach to find their uh, utility they associate with each pos potential position and what potential positions they associate with each candidate. We then estimate the relative utility of each respondent that they associate with each potential, potential position on each issue. And we do this through something called conjoint analysis, very common in marketing. We then apply an augmented version of the algorithm that we developed in the management science paper in 2005 to find the optimal position for a US presidential candidate relative to the other candidate or possibly candidates. That would make the problem much more complicated, but Generally speaking, third party candidates in the United States do not get much traction, All right? Now, there is a problem with applying the product optimization approach directly to the US presidential election. And if I say the words President Clinton, I'm sorry, President, let me be specific, President Hillary Clinton or President Al Gore, you might understand what I'm saying. We do not in the United States elect our president via a purely democratic process. A candidate does not win by receiving a plurality of the votes. In fact, I always ask my undergraduate students on the first day of class just to get them thinking, what's the minimum number of votes a candidate for president needs in order to win the presidency in the United States? And they can't figure it out. Technically it's eight. If you got one vote in each of the eight largest states and you, your opponent got no votes in that, those states, it doesn't matter what happens in the other 42 states. We have a weighted system and those eight states carry over half the total weight in our country. And this system is called the Electoral College. Each state is allocated a number of votes in the Electoral College that's equal to the number of votes it has in our two houses of Congress. In the House of Representatives, we have 435 members and it's apportioned to the states by relative population. So states such as New York, California, and Texas have lots and lots of members of the House of Representatives. Other states like Wyoming and North Dakota have one. But we also give each state a number of votes that's equal to the number of senators it has. And every state has two members in the Senate. We have 50 states. 100 members. What this effectively does is it gives the small states like North Dakota and Wyoming much, much higher proportional weight than they deserve by via their, uh, their population, and it dampens the importance of the large states somewhat. Right? Now, the recipient of the plurality of votes in a state receives all of that state's electoral votes. Simple enough, right? Well, unfortunately, no, because there are two exceptions, Maine and Nebraska. Maine and Nebraska each use something called the congressional district method. They allow a separate election for president in each of their congressional districts, each of their districts for the House of Representatives. And whoever gets the plurality in each of those districts gets the one electoral vote associated with that district. Then they give the final two votes that are associated with their two votes in the Senate to whichever candidate wins the plurality across the state. So it's very possible for Maine and Nebraska to actually split their electoral votes. They never have, but it's possible. So ultimately, the candidate needs 538 over two, that's half the electoral votes plus one to win the presidency. Now, if you look closely at the slide, you see 435 members of the House of Representatives and 100 members for the Senate. That doesn't add up to 400, uh, 538. We have three more to account for. That's accounted for by the District of Columbia. The United States Capitol does not sit in any state. It's a separate district. 
And in order to give people of that district a voice in our elections, we give um, uh, the District of Columbia a number of votes that they would earn based on their population, but it's capped at the smallest number of electoral votes any state receives. Right now, the smallest state has one member of the House of Representatives, so it receives three electoral votes, which means that's what um, Washington, D.C. gets. I think the population actually would merit four, but uh, because of the rules, it only gets three. And that's a fairly recent occurrence. For, for centuries, Washington, D.C. did not get representation in the presidential election. Right, so the factors that we need to consider are voter characteristics, that includes demographics and party affiliation. We need to consider the Electoral College, which we just discovered. We need to consider candidate characteristics, the positions on the key issues of the candidate that we are modeling, and the positions on the key issues that that candidate's opponent holds. All right, uh, we control voter characteristics and Electoral College with stratified sampling. That's the term I was looking for earlier. And we control or, or we assess candidate characteristics with conjoint analysis. All right, we need a little more notation. We're gonna have another formulation. Now, instead of N, we have N of J, which is the number of respondents from state J. We have E of J, which is the number of electoral votes for state J. And as you can imagine, that is going to end up being the, uh, the weight that we have in our objective function. And you do wanna notice that J equals one through 56 now. Uh, and then we have Z of J, which is a zero one variable that's gonna be one if over half the respondents in state J are captured by the platform that we put together for our candidate and zero otherwise. This definition presupposes we really only have two meaningful candidates. All right, now the reason we have 56 instead of 51 for uh, the maximum value for J is because of Maine and Nebraska. Right, Maine and Nebraska, we have to treat each congressional district in Maine and Nebraska as a separate state and that with one vote each, and then we have to treat Maine and Nebraska each as separate states with two votes. Right, and this is what the uh, formulation looks like. I've highlighted the changes in red. These constraints now add up the utility that a respondent associates with the prototype platform that we've built on the left. And if in fact, that total utility for respondent I exceeds the hurdle H of I, which is the actual utility that we estimate for the opponent, then the YIJ for that respondent can become one, All right? This set of constraints is brand new. This determines whether the candidate we're modeling receives enough votes to win state J. So we have 56 uh, of these types of constraints. All right, this is pretty familiar. This ensures that a candidate can only occupy one position on each issue. Um, I've got a lot of um, flack about that over time because uh, we're known in the United States for having politicians who you know, can talk out of every side of their mouth and adopt a lot of different positions on issues. The objective function now counts the number of electoral college votes that we capture with the platform we designed for our candidate. And we have a whole bunch of zeros and ones, which are pretty much uh, what we've described before. Uh, and they are what makes finding the optimal collections of uh, collection of positions really mathematically challenging. But that again is another paper, All right? So what does this model really do? Once again, it uses the positions that a respondent associates with the opposition candidate and the utility associated by the same respondent with these positions to find the utility that the respondent associates with the opposition candidate. That becomes our hurdle. We then find the collection of positions, again, limiting ourselves to one position on each issue that generate more value than the opposition candidate for respondents in a manner that maximizes the total number of electoral votes received by the candidate we're modeling for. And this is a little simpler in appearance at least because as we mentioned before, there are only two viable candidates in a U.S. presidential election, All right? So now what we did is we worked with a company in Cincinnati called Marketing Re Market Vision Research. We collected data from a nationwide panel. 
This panel, this, these data were collected from the panel through an internet administered survey, 1,200 respondents. And I'll talk a little bit about, about that in a little bit. Uh, we used a fractional factorial design to collect our conjoint data. We collected the data for our initial run from October 27th through November 1st, 2004. This was the George W. Bush versus John Kerry election. And then we compared our results to projections based on responses to the question, for which candidate will you vote on Tuesday? This is the standard poll question. So in addition to collecting all the data we needed from our respondents, we also asked them who they're gonna vote for. That way we could compare our results to what we would have gotten if we just did a standard newspaper type poll. Now, you might look at this 1200 observations or 1200 respondents and say, you know, Jim, you're not much of a statistician. You got 56 different units that you need to estimate over and you're spreading 1200 observations or responses across them. That's hardly a sufficient number to give you decent power. And when they told me that they could only give me about 1200 respondents, uh, I, I agreed. I was really disappointed. And then I had an epiphany. I only had to go to what are called battleground states. Battleground states are the states where, uh, as the election approaches, the, the outcome is still uncertain. There are many states across the United States where we know how the vote is going to go. California always goes for Democrats. New York always goes for Democrats. Texas always goes for Republicans. So we found an article in Time Magazine in the October 25th, 2004 issue, so we're really cutting it close here, all right, that identified the battleground states. So if you look at this map, the states in red are the ones that they felt would go to George Bush with, with almost certainty. The blue they thought would go to John Kerry with almost certainty, and the ones that are in sort of the gray shade are the ones they thought were still up for play. So you see that George Bush, by Times' uh, way of looking at it, had 181 electoral votes secured. John Kerry had 168 secured, and there were 189 that were still undetermined. In other words, it was divided almost one-third, one-third, one-third. And you might look at the map and go, all I see is red. Well, if you look at the map closely, though, you see that uh, John Kerry is going to carry California. He's going to carry Illinois. He's going to carry New York. Those are three of the eight states that I mentioned before that you need to carry with one vote each and still win the election. Those are three of the largest states. The only one of the eight largest states that uh, actually two that George Bush looked like he was going to carry at this point are Texas and Georgia. And they are much smaller, especially Georgia, than California or New York. Uh, and that, that's how you get this difference. So. If you look, though, at the number of battleground states, ah, there's still 18. That's a lot of battleground states to spread the 1,200 observations over responses. I really wanted to get to over 100 observations per state. There's no way I can say whether or not that generates substantial power, but it seemed reasonable. So what I decided to do at that point is ignore the smallest eight of the battleground states, and that leaves us with these states. And that actually comes out to a hundred and I believe 59. So it's almost all the battleground electoral votes. This is what we modeled over. How does uh, George Bush or John Kerry uh, maximize their performance across these 10 states? All right. So we had responses from 100 plus uh, members of the panel from each of the selected battleground states on conjoint responses so we could estimate the utility, demographics, uh, party affiliation for each respondent, uh, what each respondent perceived each candidate's position to be on each issue, their likelihood of voting, and their voter intent. Who did they intend to vote for? And this was very close to the election, so we're hoping that's a meaningful question. All right. Uh, these are the, uh, the issues that we elected to include when we collected the conjoint data. Uh, in the 2004 election, we thought gun control, healthcare, homeland security, and abortion were important issues. And you can see underneath the different levels that we used for each of these uh, issues. 
Uh, gay marriage, education, the environment, and social security were important. The Iraq war, fiscal responsibility, taxes, and foreign policy were important. Tort reform and national defense were also important. All right, so we have 14 issues. Uh, most of the issues have two or three positions that you can adopt. These are the results that we got. All right, this is raw votes. On the left, popular vote. Raw means how many actual votes Bush and Kerry got in each state. Proportion means what is the proportion of votes that Bush and Kerry got in each state. So you can look at the popular vote columns and it's pretty easy to see Bush won Arizona, Bush won Colorado, Bush won Florida, Kerry won Michigan, Kerry won Minnesota, Bush won Missouri, Bush won Ohio, Kerry won Pennsylvania, Kerry won Washington, Kerry won Wisconsin, uh, and Bush came out slightly ahead overall, even though that's not really relevant. On the right-hand side, you see survey columns. The two columns at the left of that, that block, standard poll, that is an indication of the results that we got from our respondents when we asked them who they intended to vote for. On the right, we have the conjoint projection. This is the proportion of votes that we projected Bush and Kerry to get from our respondents in each of the battleground states. So we look at the conjoint projection versus the standard poll. We see that the conjoint projection actually outperformed the standard poll in Arizona, Colorado, Florida, Minnesota, Ohio, Washington, and Wisconsin. We got all of those right. All right, the standard poll performed better in Michigan, uh, Missouri, and Pennsylvania, which means conjoint outperformed standard polling in 70% of the battleground states. Now, once again, you might say, that doesn't really mean anything because you're counting every state equally. And we just saw that states like Pennsylvania and Ohio have more weight than states like Colorado and Arizona. So let's look at the electoral projections, All right? All right, here we have the electoral votes. I've um, colored the electoral votes in red if they're associated with Republicans and blue if they're associated with Democrats. So if you look at the actual results, you can see that the Republican candidate, George W. Bush, won Arizona, Colorado, Florida, Missouri, Ohio, and that's it. Uh, obviously, Kerry won the rest. Uh, the next column tells you what the standard poll question that we ask our respondents would have told us. And you can see, uh, you're looking at a landslide if we could have counted on our standard poll, but a landslide for John Kerry. If you looked at our conjoint projection, you can see that we actually called for Bush. We went over a bit, but we did call for Bush. So the standard poll is wrong in Arizona. It's wrong in Colorado. It's wrong in Florida, all right? It's right in Michigan and the conjoint projection is wrong in Michigan. Uh, the standard poll is wrong in Ohio. Both the standard poll and the conjoint projection are wrong in Pennsylvania. And the conjoint projection was wrong in Wisconsin. All right, the standard poll results that we got from our respondents mirrored what the media polls were saying right up to the election. They were all calling for a John Kerry election. Our conjoint projection called for a George Bush victory, and that's what we saw, albeit not by the margin that we called. All right, we can also do a little sensitivity analysis uh, for John Kerry, for example. This is John Kerry's optimal set of positions on all of those issues that I showed you before relative to what people perceived in our responses, what people perceived to be George Bush's positions. So you can see at optimality, John Kerry would have gotten 83.5% of the vote. So again, you might say, why didn't Kerry win? Well, if you know much about US uh, elections and you look at the, uh, the optimal positions for John Kerry, it basically looks a lot like the optimal positions for a Republican. And John Kerry could not adopt those positions. Now, if we try to find the second best uh, uh, set of positions for John Kerry, this is what we get. And I've highlighted what changes in yellow. And you can see when you go from the optimal to the second best, you get a big drop off in the total coverage from 83.5% to 70%. All right, when you go to the third optimal, you get an even bigger drop off. George Bush, on the other hand, there's his optimal uh, set of positions. You get a small drop off to the suboptimal 
and then a small, smaller drop off to the sub suboptimal. So what that says is George Bush had really entrenched himself in a very easy to defend position, right? Another sensitivity analysis, and this is gonna be about the last thing we talk about. You could fix the position on one issue for a candidate and assess his support. You do this for every potential position on each salient attribute for a candidate, and then you repeat for the other candidate. Here's an example, all right? Let's talk about the assault weapon ban, all right? What this table shows you is which states John Kerry would have gained or lost if he had been consistently perceived as being in favor of extending the assault weapon ban or allowing it to lapse. In red, we see the same results for George Bush. And this tells us that nothing would have changed if either of those candidates had been perceived as absolutely consistent on this issue in either way. And that tells us that voters either associated very little utility with this, so it, couldn't, it wouldn't sway the results, or they already perceived the candidate's positions relatively consistently. One that might be a little more interesting is healthcare. This table tells us that if John Kerry had con been consistently perceived by our respondents as being in favor of a national system, he would have lost Washington. He's carrying Washington in our data right now. He would have lost it if he'd been perceived as consistently being for a national healthcare system. If George W. Bush had been perceived by our respondents as favoring a national system consistently, he would have lost Florida and Wisconsin to John Kerry. One more example, Homeland Security, and I think this is really interesting. Uh, if John Kerry had been perceived as supporting the Patriot Act, he would have gained Florida and Wisconsin from George Bush. If George Bush had been perceived as opposing the Patriot Act, he would have lost Florida and Wisconsin to John Kerry. We do something similar with abortion, Social Security, gay marriage, the environment, education, foreign policy, the Iraq war, taxes, fiscal responsibility, national defense, and tort reform. So this gives us a pretty good idea of what, the, what kind of latitude the candidates have in their positions. All right, so our preliminary conclusions are that conjoint analysis did outperform standard polling by quite a bit for the popular vote and for the electoral college vote. It supports analysis of sensitivity, which could support changes in platform or changes in message, and it enables a candidate to better assess her or his weaknesses and her or his opponent's weaknesses by the geography and demography of the voters. Finally, it enables a candidate to determine his or her approximate optimal platform and estimate what would result from that platform in terms of electoral support. It also is rather sensitive to sample size, and that might be because we didn't really have a large sample in any state. Uh, it is more expensive and more time consuming to administer than a standard poll. It's also more difficult to explain to an electorate. All right, and this last slide is just for entertainment. It's a question. Right now we're looking at Donald Trump versus Joe Biden in the 2020 US presidential election. But if they've read my research, are we really talking about Trump and Stein versus Biden Stein. All right. So we've got time for questions. And I promised Mark that I would actually give him a sign. Here, just getting one last slide. And this is thank you in every language I've ever had to say it in at a conference. Uh, and don't ask me what all the languages are because Five days after I leave, I generally forget the little bit of whatever foreign language I, I try to learn on a trip. But thank you for your attention and I am happy to answer any questions you have.